Thank you, Arden. Hi, everybody. Um, maybe we should just start with introductions, Lauren. I can't see you. It's like disorientating. Oh, there you are. <laughs> <laughs> I know I when you said you wanted to do the screen sharing I was like yay because I can see everyone it's really nice uh, but yeah absolutely so um, I think many of you know my name is Lauren I'm the director of inclusive post-secondary in BC um, work alongside Arden and all of our wonderful facilitators um, at the campuses here um, yeah that's me um, my name is Madeline Olette, and I'm a regional coordinator with Inclusive Postsecondary Education um, with Inclusion Alberta. So I'm in Edmonton, Alberta, and I oversee um, two postsecondary institutes, Nate, which is in Edmonton, and Augustana Campus, which is um, in Camrose, Alberta. And I also oversee um, our career development coordinator, who is um, has been in the presentation or the symposium, um, and her name's Brittany. So I think we can get started, Lauren, if you want to do. Yeah, sure. Yeah, that sounds good. So I think um, this is, I think we're the last sort of session of the day and then there's some hall time after this, but I think it's a great, um, the flow of today I think has worked really well, sort of talking about before um, before post-secondary and, and that pathway into post-secondary. And I think employment sort of brings us to what is, you know, after post-secondary look like, um, but really thinking about sort of employment, not as something that comes once you graduate, but something a career being something that you build upon and that that universities sort of have this um, built into their structure there's sort of this understanding that that students are working towards careers and, and looking for long term you know valued um, career pathways and so um, hoping to just share you know and, and learn from all of you as well around how to leverage those um, opportunities that exist within the post-secondary environment already um, for students um, so that they benefit from those sort of moving into fully inclusive lives after post-secondary. Um, so first, um, this is sort of just a general agenda. We'll be talking about sort of the socially valued role of, of students, um, sort of following the normative pathway and, and what that means in terms of employment. And we talked a lot about sort of the normative pathway over the last three days and, and a lot today as well. Um, so just kind of touching on that briefly and then um, hear from you around sort of how you've uh, leveraged employment on your campuses and, and talk a little bit about some alumni stories where we've seen that um, work really well in NBC and Alberta. Um, look at some employment statistics and then have hopefully, a, you know, a decent amount of time at the end for a breakout uh, conversation. Awesome. Thanks. Um, so I think we wanted to first start um, just opening with, you know, where are we coming from, where do our um, values lie with within looking for employment. Um, so I wanted to share um, a little bit of an article that um, really resonates with me and helps me um, kind of ground my thoughts around like what what is an inclusive life. Um, so this is a um, article that was put together by Bruce Uditsky and also Janet Cleese and Robin Acton. Um, so I'll just read a little bit from that. If one holds a view that regardless of the nature or, or complexity of an individual's intellectual disability, they are inherently complete in their humanness then their lives should look no different than the lives of individuals without intellectual disabilities. An inclusive life happens when the lives of children and adults with intellectual disabilities unfold no differently, immersed together and with their non-disabled peers in the same pathways and experience of life common to us all. People with developmental disabilities are often inherently assumed to not want the same things in life as you and I. And because of this assumption, they're excluded from the parts of life where we find access to things like a meaningful paid job, um, finding love or dating, having a family and making lifelong friendships. Um, 
And then just touching on the normative pathway. And I think, you know, talking about this has been a theme and understandably a theme sort of throughout the last three days. Um, but when I was thinking about the slide, I came back to sort of the concept of discernment that Arden and um, uh, talked about at the beginning of the session and talking and thinking about discernment again, just as a refresher as sort of what is the typical experience um, that students are having? How close uh, are students to that typical experience? Um, what are the types of supports students are, you know, have access to? What do they look like? And um, how are those supports harmonious with the campus context? And I think that that's sort of a helpful sort of starting point in thinking about not only um, academics on campus, but employment as well. Um, so thinking about what is a typical employment pathway for a university student, um, and we know that a typical employment pathway for a person with disabilities is really embedded in that, you know, segregated disability um, specific, often really, you know, low value and low expectation. Um, and so if post-secondary is going to be a catalyst for people um, to lead fully inclusive lives and have access to all of the things that build into that, um, it, it needs to start by, you know, post-secondary needs to, to, or students need to be accessing all of those things in post-secondary um, to, to build from that. Um, and so, you know, I think sometimes it's also important, I think, when we're thinking about discernment to, to sort of reflect on where we're deviating from a normative pathway and, and why. So I think sometimes what might come up is, you know, what we do, you, we may deviate sort of from a competitive employment strategy um, when we're supporting students to find you know paid high value work um, but I think that that's an example of um, of you know a, a needed adaptation we know that there's a huge inequity in in competitive employment and and who ends up getting those roles and and we know that um, often the process is involved in in the, you know, seeking jobs through competitive employment, you know, they're not really actually identifying who is the best fit for this role, who is the best fit for um, this company. Um, there, there's lots of other things at play. So um, if we look at sort of other options um, into employment, the tech industry is a great example. So if you go on any, um, or not any, but a lot of sort of big tech companies uh, websites, they'll have this button saying, send us your resume, tell us why you're interested, tell us what you think you could offer. Um, and so that's sort of a strategy that um, that we use anyway, when, when we're um, building towards sort of this employment for students. It requires a lot of networking, um, relationship building, and um, we can utilize all of the things that are in universities um, to, to get towards that. So as we've sort of talked about, you know, universities have this understanding that, you know, beyond an institution of higher learning for the sake of learning, which is wonderful in itself, um, that students go to university, um, you know, nearly every student is going to university thinking about their future goals and that often includes career, almost always includes career. Um, and this is, you know, really evidence when we look at sort of the experiential, uh, the experiential opportunities beyond the classroom that are embedded um, or partnered with campuses. Um, so I wanted everybody to take a moment just to think about what those look like on your campus and maybe share some examples in the chat. Um, I have sort of the example of an education student, but please feel free to think, you know, more broadly than that. Um, and just take a moment to, to type those into the chat. Yeah, so we've got student jobs on campus, cooperative education, student union.
volunteer opportunities, career fairs. Career services. Maybe thinking back to, for, for those of us who went to post-secondary, um, ways in which we connected with our university when we were trying to sort of build that career identity. Connections with professors, yeah. Wow, <laughs> everything's coming perfect. Yeah, lots of connections, classmates, practicum, field placements, work studies. Exactly, awesome. Sports events, guest speakers. Networking events. It's all about who you know, workshops, career services, yeah. Student event nights, absolutely. Awesome. Yeah, those are all great. Um, and, and so, yeah, for my example, sort of an education student, I don't think I have anything um, different than that. Oh, the only other thing I had on here, and it's interesting, we touched on it in the last session was um, of student leadership roles. Yeah, a great example. Um, I also had on here sort of alumni foundations, um, which is interesting that we ended up talking about that a little bit, but our students that we support accessing those. Um, can they utilize those to for career connections um, after graduation? So again, thinking about all of the ways throughout a full four to five year university experience that students are sort of building towards this and utilizing all of these things that exist. Um, because the risk I think of not doing that is that post-secondary education can um, have the potential to become sort of a nice four to five year experience um, that loses momentum after students graduate. But if students have built all of these relationships, they can, they can also utilize them as alumni afterwards and, and still leverage that um, post-secondary alumni role. Can I move to the next slide? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, so we wanted to um, share some stories uh, when me and Lauren were meeting kind of um, just reflecting on what connects with us when people are presenting. So I wanted to share a story about Kelly um, and really thinking about um, how she followed the normative path through her um, time at college and university and um, some examples of employment that I think are really great to share. So. Kelly's from Edmonton, Alberta, um, and she was interested in taking the veterinary medical assistant program. And she was actually accepted into the program at Lakeland College, which is um, in Vermilion, which is um, a little tiny town. Um, and it's about two hours away from her home and her family. Um, Kelly followed that normative path of a post-secondary student moving um, out of her hometown away from mom and dad. And she lived in dorms on campus, which I think really um, helped her be immersed in all parts of campus and being a student. So um, doing campus activities, uh, building relationships with classmates and other people on campus. And um, she was able to take some really awesome courses like uh, animal diseases and surgery classes and even sheep production, which I think is pretty unique. Um, and I always liked hearing about um, kind of those more farm animals, which I think is fun. Um, when I kind of reflect on Kelly's journey of uh, inclusive post-secondary, I think her success now um, really um, can be kind of associated with following that normative path throughout. Um, so during her first summer um, within post-secondary kind of, you know, you finish your first year, you're looking forward to a break. Um, she really enjoyed volunteering at a veterinary clinic in her community of Edmonton, but she also wanted to have a paid job, which I think is really um, normative and great for stu all students, right? They need um, money to get through the rest of the year. So through a family connection, she was able to find an office assistant um, job and 
that job, although it wasn't directly related to veterinary studies, it did really um, help her kind of gain skills within um, the admin side. So the filing and the scanning and digitizing information. Um, when Kelly went back to school in Vermilion, uh, she obtained a paid position at a vet clinic in Vermilion and um, she was a clinic assistant so she did really typical things of an assistant um, in a clinic she stocked the surgery room she sanitized equipment um, she restrained animals and she would also assist in appointments with the vet as needed with the patients and the clients um, and um, she also would like walk or feed the animals um, as needed and as Kelly grew her skills in the veterinary medical assistant program, um, she was able to work in the clinic in Vermilion, and she was also offered a um, paid position um, in the community vet clinic in which she had volunteered for so many years. Um, so she was able to maintain these two positions, um, kind of going back and forth from home to school, home to school, and it kind of really helped her um, within the program kind of being able to um yeah just gain those skills and that confidence within it um in 2020 she was accepted um, or completed her studies at lakeland in the animal studies program and she um, really wanted to continue um, schooling in some capacity so she applied to the biological sciences program in edmonton at nate um, and just continue to kind of round out that knowledge and her skills in the animal industry. And now Kelly's working um, six days a week in the vet clinic in Edmonton. And she completed her studies just a couple weeks ago and is really looking forward to um, finishing um, or kind of moving into that next, that next part of life, right? Um, working almost full time and um, building on those relationships at work and outside of work. Um, so I think for me, it's really um, a reflection of what was that, that normative path. I think she followed it um, almost to a T. And I think that um, really helped her set her up in about four years to come out with a really awesome job and lots of great skills that I think will um, kind of yeah just be a really great beginning for the rest of her adult life there's a couple other pictures that i think are just kind of fun of kelly in the clinic um, i've got a couple of examples uh from sf or sorry from from bc as well one from sfu and, and one from ubc um and I think it's so helpful to share these um, these examples because they really they really clearly lay out that the normative pathway works for everyone. Um, that with sort of creative thinking around where some modifications might be needed and and really leveraging relationships and that valued student role that students already have um, that the same you know, the same pathway works, right? So why are we, you know, deviating <laughs> from it? Um, so this example from SFU, the student uh, started their post-secondary education sort of with this big goal of becoming the announcer for the Vancouver Canucks. And he was often reminded by um, others and had been for quite a long time that this was an unrealistic career goal. Um, but the inclusion facilitators that worked with him focused sort of, instead of how realistic or unrealistic the career goal was, um, focused around um, identifying the pathways that any other person would take um, to work towards this goal. What would that look like? Um, so the student enrolled at SFU as a communication student where he studied topics related to media and broadcasting. Um, he became an active member of the communication student union, which opened up a lot of opportunities like volunteering with the athletics department on games day. Um, and those relationships led to a paid position working as a DJ for the basketball games. Um, during those games, he received training and was able to sort of shadow um, the announcers to build some of those skills and experiences. Um, during the summer, he worked for Vancouver um, virtual tourism company, 
Um, and after experience there, um, he was able to take on a new role as the announcer for those virtual tours. He convocated with a certificate of completion in communications and um, sort of still works in tourism and, and is pursuing more opportunities to announce at sporting events. Um, but through that sort of normative pathway in those studies, he developed the skills and the knowledge, um, you know, in the same ways that any other person would um, to take on these opportunities. And it was through sort of these relationships um, on campus uh, within sort of his classroom, as well as the broader campus and the athletics department and student union. Um, and then just as a point of interest, so this, this student is now is an alumni now, um, but actually just announced at a Canucks game last month, which I think is really exciting. Um, and again, we didn't facilitate that opportunity at all, but I would really like to think that this pathway um, and all of this experience and having this be a goal that he'd been very, very clearly working towards in the same way as anybody else, hopefully, is, is part of what led to that opportunity as well. And then for the UBC example, I think that this is, I, I kind of picked this example because I think it's important that we're really showcasing that this is possible for any student. Um, so this was a UBC student um, who had an interest in computers, um, had, been, had sort of sought employment support through employment, um, disability specific employment services in the past. Um, and had been deemed by at that time was deemed unemployable. They wouldn't use that language now. They would say high barriers to employment, um, but that was the messaging to him and his family um, by those um, service providers. Um, so at, at UBC, he enrolled in computer science program um, and leveraged the relationships and sort of career up building opportunities that existed on campus and within the computer science faculty to find um, high value employment and marine science, which is really exciting. So setting that all up was sort of the facilitator set a really, you know, a standard of high expectations with professors as we do for, for all students. Um, and was really intentional around building relationships um, with faculty um, and really leaned on them to help identify areas of computer science that they felt he would have the greatest strengths as people who are more familiar with the field. Um, through these relationships with faculties, um, he as well as facilitators sort of learned the language and the culture of, of the tech industry. Um, and over the first couple of years, it was identified that quality, by his profs actually, that quality insurance was an area that they felt he had a lot of strength. Um, and so through those relationships with faculty, um, the student was connected with a global underwater research project that was using sensors on the ocean floor on the BC coast and sending that data kind of across the world globally. Um, and so there was the facilitation of a mutually beneficial role where the student was able to provide this quality assurance by watching for readings that were coming in that seemed off. So there was um, sort of a, a scope of readings that were in a normal range and then anything that was outside of that range he would flag for the engineers. Um, and it was a really mutually beneficial uh, role because the creation of it um, utilized the student's strengths in computer science and in a field that he wanted to be in and, and also freed up the time of the engineers um, to work on technical repairs and research instead of having to have one of them sort of watching for this data uh, at all times. Um, and I also think that this is a good example because this was sort of a student who knew that he had an interest in computers and family knew he had an interest in computers, but what a final job or career pathway um, would look like or what, you know, was a bit less clear. Um, so this is an also, also an example of when, you know, a student doesn't necessarily have a clear dream job. Um, how we can, you know, just like any other student, how the, that student can utilize all of those resources on campus to identify what that could be, what could be a good fit for them. Thanks, Lauren. Um, before we wanted to share um, some like concrete um, stats around employment for inclusive post-secondary, but we wanted to really look at um, what does it look like in Canada and 
um, be able to kind of reflect on that as we kind of look at Alberta and BC um, as we move through the presentation. So just a couple, couple stats here, 31% employment rate of adults with disabilities um, compared to the 80% national average. Um, I'd say that's pretty pretty um, pretty horrible and uh, of course 28 percent poverty rate overall 61 percent poverty rate if you're living alone 40 percent um, if you're living with a single parent and then the um, average yearly income is about 19 um, thousand so thinking about um, what that might look like for somebody and um, what would it look like to live on that um, amount of a yearly income, I think can be um, a good reflection, I think. Um, so we just wanted to look briefly at those as before we moved on um, kind of to our own stats. And I just also want to acknowledge before, just really quickly before we move on, um, that those don't include specific stats for um, Indigenous uh, people with developmental disabilities that there isn't sort of a distinction and, and often actually not a recording of that data for um, the Stats Canada information. So um, just just want to acknowledge that that doesn't necessarily reflect the real re the reality for for everybody living in in Canada. Um, but what we also know, and interestingly, this is uh, this is from the same article that you know gave out those really depressing statistics. Um, is an acknowledgement that a higher level of education is always associated with a higher level um, of employment. Um, that this was true for people with or without disabilities, and it was true regardless of the severity of disability. That's their language. Um, and more interestingly, they, they think the differences between people with disabilities and those without a disability were significantly smaller um, among those who had a higher level of education. Um, and so I want to pose a question back to you all. Um, why do you think that that's the case? Is it sort of all academics or do you think that there's more to that difference? Feel free to yeah, raise a hand or type in the chat or jump in. Uh, Rachel? Yeah, I, I absolutely think there's more than the education there. We know that most jobs in the job market today across the board are made through connections and who knows who, um, and a lot of them aren't even posted. And so when you have university and post-secondary education, it creates all these connections, whether it's through friends, through classmates, through professors, through career services that now know you and your interests and your skills. So when you have people who know that, they're able to kind of connect some of those pieces that help step foot in the job market in ways that unfortunately you can't without those connections. Yeah, I agree. Um, in the chat, I see um, university student is a valued role and we know that valued roles lead to opportunities. Yeah, and more overall opportunities in the chat as well. Mm, and that university is seen as a typical pathway to career. So there's sort of an expectation that post-secondary students are working and going to be working. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And there's, I, I don't know the exact answer. It would be really interesting to, to you know, if Sats Canada did some work on, um, on that or somebody else did. Um, uh, and there was another um, article that I didn't take a quote from, but it was interesting. It acknowledged also that it was this difference um, in, in terms of a significantly higher employment rate was not dependent on the type of diploma, degree, or certificate that students received. Um, so I thought that was really interesting too. So nothing was sp specifically tied to inclusive post-secondary, but I think that that was a good acknowledgement that it's um, something's happening sort of beyond the higher level of academic education. So looking at sort of BC's 2021 employment stats, and again, thinking of this, you know, reflecting back on those really, um, again, depressing is the only word I can think to use, um, employment stats for kind of, uh, you know, across Canada. Um, 
I'm happy to, you know, even in the midst of a global pandemic, say that, you know, about 74% of students are, you know, currently have paid employment that's sort of starting now or are set to start up during this summer. Um, and that is an uh, all employment that aligns with their career goals or program of study or interests in a way that builds into a career. Um, and that through sort of this last academic year, um, about 55% of students were employed while they were taking classes. Um, some, a lot of that was, um, some of that was on campus, some was, some was off campus. Um, and that over the last term and going into the summer, um, four students were employed through a co-op or work study at their campus. Um, and I forgot to add a student in there that um, was employed on, on campus through a research assistant position as well. That's awesome. Thanks, Lauren. Um, I wanted to share from 2020 just because it was such a weird year and it continues to be. So um, when we looked at employment across um, Alberta, um, about 70% of students that completed their studies were employed. 61% um, um, of the students were um, employed in positions within their field of study. And um, between 75 and 80% of returning and new students were employed in 2020. Um, I think it's, it's a way to feel hopeful and a reminder that um, employment for um, people with developmental disabilities throughout a pandemic, I think um, we made it a um, priority to ensure that the students that we supported were also pursuing employment in the same way that we know lots of other people were doing. Some students um, got laid off or lost their job, but it didn't mean that um, we didn't support students to also look for additional um, work because we knew that that would be the normative pathway for everyone else um, in a pandemic. And we saw the, the benefits of that, the connections, getting out of the house, um, also getting used to just, you know, maybe lowering a little, little bit of that anxiety of always being at home, having to leave home and um, interact with people again was, of course, um, I think important for everyone. Uh, when we look just at this year, 2021, approximately 62% of students work part-time in addition to their academic studies, which I think um, would be really typical of all students. You gotta make that money, pay for your uh, Starbucks coffee and that sort of thing. Um, two students were employed on a full-time basis um, in, addition, in addition to their studies. So I think um, those were two very busy students um, that I think were getting a lot out of their positions at work. Um, and two students also worked at more than one place of employment. So again, I think, you know, that just those benefits of going to work really, um, we saw those, especially during um, the pandemic. And then just within 2021, about one third of students are employed um, in positions that are related to their programs of study. So our timing has been great. We actually, <laughs> I always find that I end up with less time at the end, but this was good. Uh, we've got time to do the breakout room and we've got time, I think, to come back and share, um, share the conversation. So. Um, we'd like to do a breakout room with about, um, I think, five people per room for about, about 10 minutes. Um, and if you could, um, I think that the idea that Marta had around having sort of a note taker or somebody sort of collecting a little bit of the conversation could be really helpful um, to come and, and share back with us. Um, and the question, which I will type in the chat. I'll paste it. Oh, perfect. Oh, thank you. Um, so just thinking through how did being the role of being a post-secondary student safeguard employment and reduce isolation during COVID? Um, and so I know that we also had lots of experience of students losing jobs and, and, um, and so I don't want to minimize that, but I want to think about all of the ways um, that post-secondary institutions um, all either already had in place things to sort of safeguard employment and career planning for students um, and and how that role of post-secondary student um, yeah was it was still a benefit during the the pandemic 
So I will make the breakout round. And we'll be back in about 10 minutes. to take uh, sort of the rest of the time to chat about um, and continue conversations from uh, those breakout rooms and, and of course open up to any other conversation around employment that you want to um, share share um, and get sort of or share what you're doing um, with your initiatives but maybe first the breakout rooms if um, I think the, the putting up the hand option seemed to work really well so as people are maybe ready to share some of the conversation from their breakout rooms um, you can do that and uh, we'll call on you from there. I can share for my group, Lauren, if that's oh, yeah. helpful to start. Uh, we had a really good conversation. Um, I think one piece, um, thinking about like safeguarding employment or also reducing isolation, um, being able to go to school and um, have that structure really helps students um, in that time, especially at the beginning when everyone felt kind of lost and you're floating around not knowing what to do. Um, and just a tiny bit of structure each day, I think, um, was helpful for everybody, but also for the students that um, we support. Um, also being able to um, have that kind of shared experience of we're all in this together. Um, even though like being home alone can feel isolating, it does make a difference to have those um, classmates or peers or your coworkers to kind of commiserate with um, or talk about the pandemic with. Um, and we also talked a little bit about um, just how cool um, we've seen um, different ways that jobs have come up. So something like a remote job um, really is something we wouldn't have explored maybe before the pandemic and now we're looking at that more it's also a really normative um, way to be employed right now um, so it's cool to see that students that we support are also doing that i see natalia shared a bit in the chat did you want to elaborate on on that natalia yeah for sure we had really interesting conversations about um that uncertainty, like you mentioned, Madeline, but also the goal restructuration and losing that routine and how scary that was um, for students and facilitators, kind of everyone within it. Um, and then we also talked about the new role of the family, whereas sadly, because of the pandemic, before students had their routines of being, commuting to school, picking their own place, and now going back to relying more on families and spending more time together. And in terms of opportunities, we talked about how pandemic offered uh, for some students to become like uh, knowledgeable resources in technology in their courses, right? Where they're like accustomed to Zoom. So that's kind of one benefit. And the also highlighting the importance of family connection and elaborating on that, right? So that they know what their goals are, um, even when they change throughout the pandemic. I see Laura. Thank you. Um, yeah, so our group talked a little bit about um, like the Canadian Summer Grant for funding jobs and other student specific grants um, that are available, especially right now during the pandemic when employment is kind of a challenge that um, the whole country is facing. Um, we talked about um, how there's a little bit of a sort of societal recognition of the importance of university years. So there's a little bit of safeguarding maybe that happens during this time um, for student related opportunities. Um, also because everything or a lot of things have moved to online, there's kind of greater access to events or resources that wouldn't otherwise be reachable for um, like networking or just like learning about new things. Um, you can, attend events that are happening in other areas of the world, the country, um, there's no limit to the number of attendees, stuff like that. Um, and then also the move to online class has made class um, more accessible for some people in some ways. Rachel? So uh, our, our group, we forgot to say who was gonna be the note taker and who was gonna report back. So I'm just gonna do my best. <laughs> Um, 
yeah, we, we talked about a lot of similar things about how being a student um, really enabled this really enabled the students we were working for to to have that sense of belonging whether it was just you know commiserating over like um, dealing with technology errors and dealing with um, asynchronous classes they they had they had that uh, that route to be able to connect with others um, and being in an online environment also opened up the opportunity for students to learn about different types of uh, technology they could use to connect with others. So there were a lot of students who were connecting over social media and then became Facebook friends after or joined in a WhatsApp group and, and still have connections to those people. And so in, in a sense, um, being a university student uh, during the pandemic also helped to create um, ways, to, ways to extend some of the connections they've built after university. Um, some of the other things we talked about was, you know, just being a university student and and going into classes gave you that break away from all of the the news happening and all of the different things going on in the world. It was it was kind of a, a safe space to go into your classroom um, and and have something different, something something break up your day. Um, Mandy, Marta, or Lisa. <laughs> Feel free, to, feel free to jump in if there's anything I'm missing. Um, yeah, that's that's all I that's all I can remember right now. <laughs> I think to add to that, Rachel, we it's talked true. about we um, discussed it almost put um, that even playing field because everybody was in a sense, experiencing COVID quite similarly, and they could relate to each other, which allowed the students to be fully participating in those conversations. And, um, and then we were talking a little bit about that spotlight of, of a different or maybe a better understanding about folks who are isolated constantly, which I think everyone in this symposium can speak to um, on many levels. So we, I mean, if safeguarding means that there's learning happening, then we can add that to it for sure. Um, I think Marta was going to go from a family perspective, though. Oh, just like it was more about like um, it was more about like the employment. If, if somebody had employment, you know, prior to the pandemic, it was so, it was kind of like about maintaining it in a way, right? Um, and um, that's really all I, I, I think I wanted to say. So if, um, if it was that much harder to sort of re, to gain employment, like if you didn't have employment before the pandemic, um, I think it probably would have been harder to, to, to get employment during the pandemic. That's from a non post-secondary perspective though. I'm just talking about sort of the family um, at that point, I'll let others talk. <laughs> And then the only thing I can tack on to that is, is just as a facilitator discovering uh, different ways that students could, could work, like different styles of interviewing, um, different kinds of jobs they could have. So uh, one of the examples I gave was a student who, who facilitated a workshop online and was able to connect with, connect with other peers and people attending the workshop just through Zoom right from home and, and have that be a paid opportunity. So it also opened my mind to the different ways that work can look for people. Great. See Haranya, you have your hand up. Yeah, we and uncles we were talking about work BC funding for students and how that can um, sort of um, and then also alumni alumni connections and making call calls and um, sort of getting students really excited about that kind of stuff. So because there are connections coming from connections and um, also um, like talking about opportunities at, uh, with parents and families and family, like kind of bringing fam family engagement um, uh, and like in talking about opportunities with students and their families and like talking about um, skills that, that they have. Uh, for example, there's a student in one of our, in the last family meeting that we had, um, to, uh, the the family said that uh, the student had a Reiki certification. They want to kind of continue that um, 
and pursue that after. So like looking into opportunities for that as well. What else did I write down? Um, yeah, I think I'm gonna stop there. I'll contribute if I have something else. <laughs> Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, just to add to that, I've noticed, um, and, and I, you know, I think we've been something we've been just generally talking about um, as well. But I've noticed that you know, collaboration with families, the pandemic really kind of pushed that to the forefront. I think partially because families are often in the background or they're somewhere in the house, right? And so there's that ease of opportunity to to chat. But also, I think. Um, and a recognition that that this is a time that you know we don't want to lose time because of the pandemic for for students to be career building and so utilizing um, being really intentional about utilizing um, families as resources um, as they should be. Yeah, uh, Emily. Hey, so I was in a smaller group, which is Sandra and I. So we had the perspective of a family member and also facilitators. So um, yeah. There, Sandra has a daughter who was working and did lose employment because of the risk of COVID. And somebody in their life was actually really helpful in facilitating a new job, um, which was great. And then also um, just, I think we were all sharing in this, like having to really like learn about tech skills and stuff. And they were using Skype and WhatsApp to stay connected. Um, I was supporting a student throughout COVID and you know, during March of 2020, like a big shift was all on to online. And I think Zoom was a big introduction for a lot of us. And so that was the same for the student that I have in mind. She really, she really learned a lot and then took what she learned from that like later semester of school and ran with it into her like personal and social life and was doing these Zoom art with me for like people in her community that she met through school and clubs and stuff. So that was a way that she kind of safeguarded her herself from isolation. Um, and then facilitators working at UVic definitely were, I think, feeling like there was a lack of opportunity within the community. So we really looked at like what students can, can do for experiential learning and getting jobs and stuff just through UVic. So um, in the past year, amidst COVID, we've also created access to co-op programs and um, work study. So that's been some, some areas in which we've seen success. So that's definitely related to a student identity. Yeah, I think that, yeah, that ties in really well around um, sort of the, the value of that, that post-secondary role. Um, so I think there was, you know, just my sort of observation um, at, and, and, and in BC, of course, my observations, BC, um, sort of a response from, from universities that they recognize that they're need, they needed to do something to kind of maintain um, not just student engagement, although I think that was part of it, but, um, you know, what were the sort of imminent things facing all students at the university? So um, most kind of immediately, um, or, or within the first you know, couple months had opportunities for um, any student of the university to say rent um, computers um, or come on to be able to rent, uh, you know, still use space on campus, but really socially distanced if they needed to come and use a computer. Um, there were sort of some you know, financial um, offerings from the universities um, too. And in some cases, you know, it was really, this was just sort of like a nice moment, but a few, you know, of our key contacts on campus actually really intentionally reached out and said, like, how are the students you were, are working for, do like, what's going on? What do you guys need? Um, and, it, and that sort of the, the first time I had ever gotten a message like that sort of just randomly from, you know, a registrar <laughs> at a university. Um, so there, and um, there were also conversations here, I noticed a big increase in conversations around um, you know, the, the potential impact of the pandemic on marginalized populations and like really looking at parts of the student body that um, maybe were at more risk of, you know, financial hardship or, um, you know, social isolation. Um, and so I'm curious if that's something that other initiatives across sort of uh, the provinces noticed at their universities was there sort of a similar um, kind of response.
or maybe just more generally, like what was sort of the university response to the pandemic in terms of students? Um, one thing that UVic did was they created two websites. One was this like Teach Anywhere website for support and resources for profs and TAs. And then another one was Learn Anywhere, which is support and resources for students. And so they really like, I think, put a lot of effort into like a centralized hub for students. Like what's, what's out there, what's available, here is it, you know, in this nice condensed resource. Mm -hmm. One thing that a couple universities um, here did that that students really um, enjoyed and benefited from and wouldn't have had access to without that post-secondary student status um, were like regional cohorts. So it was this, it was um, Trinity Western did this. And it's a quite a small university. And so I think each program of study has, again, a small number of students. So they were sort of able to, to do this. I don't know if it would be possible in a, in a really large campus, um, but they essentially, for, for every student who was in the same program of study in the same year, um, somehow sort of like identified what regions these students lived in. Or I think, you, I think maybe it was students applied if they wanted to be part of a regional cohort and then you put your location like approximately where you lived. Um, and they connected groups, small groups of students um, and made like a Microsoft Teams site for them. And, and um, somebody was sort of the coordinator of the regional group and, and so would create these sort of check-in times and um, some around academics um, and some around just connecting and, and sort of how are you doing check-ins amongst peers. Um, and so the students we work for at Trinity Western all were a part of that and, and some friendships that have sort of extended outside of that cohort have developed from that. I thought that was a really cool uh, response from, from that university. Well, Laura's mentioning in the chat, um, seeing an increase in, in mental health support from universities and a greater recognition of the need and importance, new workshops, uh, websites, counseling services, wellness resources, absolutely. And then Carmen saying some universities provided opportunity to students to provide feedback on the student experience in online learning and pandemic and student forums. There were a ton of student forums. Yeah, I noticed that too, that was great. Um, and what a great you know, opportunity for students to just yeah, commiserate in the struggle of a university student during during COVID, for sure, and and provide yeah that feedback that actually went to the administration. Some of those like the president was like there and answering questions directly from the student body, which I thought was really cool. Sean, uh, uh, that saying that in Alberta, uh, programs are more willing to partner with us around classroom community. They see the need for all students to make connections. We have noticed that too. Yeah. Do you have any examples of what that's been like uh, in Alberta or what kinds of conversations you've been having? Yeah. Um, one thing I'll share is our team has become like amazing with Discord. I'm not super familiar myself, but um, lots of programs have been opening open to creating that Discord channel where students can stay connected and talk about things beyond just what's happening in their program or their classes too, but it's become kind of that social hub there. Um, as well as, you know, we found when we do the class address that's similar to, I think, what Steps Forward does um you know even just a professor saying you know it's you know it's isolating right now with things being virtual like reach out make those connections even that like small endorsement from professors i think increases that buy-in from other students who realize like you know at learning virtually at home they need to make those same connections too so i think you know just going and sharing that um, and having professors echo it has made students maybe more receptive this past year than ever before. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm 
Lisa is asking, does anyone have anything to share around uh, that students struggled with? I think Rachel has her hand up. Yeah, for Lisa's question, um, one of the struggles some of our students have had is, well, really most of our students really don't like the online platforms. Um, they just don't enjoy engaging over Zoom and find it really challenging in ways that um, means they're not really getting what they want to out of their experience. And so it's been tricky trying to find ways to keep students engaged, um, including the ones who have had the gap year when they're very focused on um, wanting that in-person connection, but it's not safe or feasible for anyone right now. So it's been an interesting challenge trying to figure out how do we still support and engage people despite what's going on. Seeing, oh, Natalia. I think similar to what uh, Rachel just mentioned, some students at SFU uh, wanted to like work out, right? And SFU organized like virtual workouts, but they're not quite the same, right? As sharing space with someone and like just seeing someone else tired. Those classes were more focused on like the instructor and that was it. And there was no opportunity for socializing after. Mm -hmm. um, Craig? Yeah, I was just gonna say, um, very similar to what both of you said, but also we've noticed that um, really dependent, of course, on the student's situation before, I'd say the, the pandemic hit. Um, but I've noticed that the ones who are already struggling with a bit of mental health um, struggles, it really amplified it, which was challenging. And um, yeah, it's tough because like there are resources available, but it's one of those things that you know, it takes a lot of, um, I'd say, patience and discipline to get through. Um, and we have yeah, just noticed it's it's really been challenging on on a couple of our students. So, mm -hmm. yeah, we're hoping you know it will kind of slowly improve. But I think that's just one of the tough parts as a facilitator too, when you kind of feel a bit powerless when um, you know there's not not too many amazing solutions really out there. Um, just keeping an eye on the time, the session is supposed to wrap up at 1230, but I also don't wanna ignore any hands that are up. So um, Haran, yeah, you guys would like to add? Yeah, I agree with what Craig and Natalia just said, uh, with students feeling like they really don't have a choice. Um, just a quick example, I was meeting with a student who was taking the year off and he was so frustrated with everything. He's like, I just want to meet somebody and be, uh, meet in person. And I felt helpless because of it. I was like, this, I can't encourage anything either uh, in person. So I was like, well, this is what we have. And um, students feeling completely powerless and um, as well. And also something I missed from like, um, the group meeting was when we discussed students who had jobs uh, on campus suddenly got all got shut down so that kind of was taken away from them it was like in a in a in a way like employment is a sense of independence and when that gets taken away it gets it kind of shifts especially with the pandemic as well so just want to share that mm -hmm. Um, in the chat, Carmen uh, has mentioned that, uh, oh, for, yeah, this is a good one. It's something we've been thinking about too. For, for first year students, they've only known campuses virtually. Um, so that not only that can that be challenging, but it's going to be interesting, you know, when things do open back up. Um, but there's going to be, you know, lots of university students who are, you know, that's their experience as well. And, and so I'm thinking universities will hopefully be thinking about that as well. Um, and then Mandy, so it's from an art school students didn't get the opportunity to see what other students were working on for projects and assignments and some questions and prompts are really broad so students didn't get to connect and see what everyone else is doing if they're sort of on the right track or not on the right track studio, studio time would be um, a typical way that students get together in the classroom yeah just be inspired by other students i imagine in art classes that that's like a fairly important element 
Yeah. Well, to sort of wrap up, I know we're a couple sec a couple minutes over, so I don't want to take too long, but just to sort of wrap up on a positive note, I think, you know, there, I, and I don't want to downplay the, the impact um, that the pandemic's had on all of us, um, and of course, including students that we work for, but, you know, thinking of what the experience of, you um, a student or, or somebody uh, with a developmental disability who is in sort of the segregated sort of vocational programs um, versus um, a post-secondary student who had, you know, even if it was sort of um, online and, and virtual where there was sort of an expectation that things would continue because you know, university students sort of demanded that they pay tuition there, there for a reason. Um, that those experiences were probably quite different and, and made a different for difference for students over this time. So, yeah. thank you guys. Thanks, well, everybody. Thank you. Natalie.